This is Duke University. Um, pleasure for me to be here and introduce Juan. Um, I uh, know that you've all seen some of um, his bio, but probably one of the things that you don't know is he was one of the very first people to give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, I'm always thankful. Um, I started with Human Rights Watch in 1992 as uh, Juan, uh, which had started, was actually America's Watch at the time, which uh, was one thing, one of many things that Juan started and grew into um, a very effective human rights organization. Um, under Juan's leadership, America's Watch, which later became the America's Division of Human Rights Watch, became a knowledgeable, creative, and most importantly, effective human rights group advocating for peoples as different as Amazonian indigenous groups, teachers, children, women, political activists across the entire Latin American region. Um, as you will know from his biography, Juan is a lawyer, an activist, a speaker, a thinker, but perhaps most importantly, he's a teacher. As Ian Martin, former Secretary of General of Amnesty International, has said, uh, Juan has conveyed his own knowledge and experience to other generations of human rights lawyers and activists. His unceasing contribution to the struggle against impunity has been both conceptual and practical, and I'm certainly one of the beneficiaries of his teaching. Not um, long out of school, Juan began representing political prisoners in Argentina. For that, he was arrested and subjected to torture and administrative detention for 18 months. He became an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience, then was expelled from the country and became an exile in the United States. His deep humanity, though, was not quelled. He's worked on behalf of migrant workers in Illinois, then for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, in 1982, he launched the America's Watch and later became a Human Rights Watch's general counsel. Uh, throughout, he's kept teaching at American University, the University of Notre Dame, Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, and Oxford, among others. He's helped shepherd a new human rights group into being in 2001, serving as president of the International Center for Transitional Justice, which is on the forefront of these questions of what do you do about the past? What do you do to actually take a country from a period of violence into a kind of peace where human rights is respected? It's vital work. And, uh, and he's also served as the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, traveling around the world to try to extinguish this barbarity. Juan knows very well how hard this work is viscerally. I should have added, along with his many uh, professional achievements, he's also a devoted family man, uh, husband, uh, father, and grandfather. Um, he suffered torture in prison. He's also sacrificed a great deal of time and energy uh, working for human rights and away from his family and his growing brood of grandchildren. He writes about this very movingly in this memoir, Taking a Stand. I urge you all to read it if you have a chance because it really is a, uh, an amazing chronicle of the human rights movement uh, internationally, but especially within the United States. We're very profoundly grateful that he's been able to spend a little time with us here today. Very kind. Thank you very much, for all of you, for being here. And Robin, thank you very much for that uh, overly generous introduction. As you see in this business of human rights, we make very good friends, and that explains uh, those words. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also happy to be part of a series that will bring to your attention the presentations of colleagues and friends of mine like Eduardo Gonzalez, like uh, David Tolbert, uh, and others, uh, I think uh, will really complement what I have to say today. Um, and I, I really commend, commend all of them to you. They, continue to do excellent work on uh, matters relating to transitional justice. <coughs> we also want to commend uh, Duke University for um, remembering that tomorrow is the 30th anniversary of the, <coughs> thank you, the groundbreaking um, appearance of the CONADEP report, the report on on disappearance of persons in Argentina during the military dictatorship. 
it is an important milestone, one that it is, it is remembered in Argentina and in the press uh, uh, today, uh, but that uh, should merit uh, more commemoration around the world as well, because in fact, the, uh, the report is one of the pieces of the transitional justice endeavors of the Argentine public and society, uh, but an important one, uh, <coughs> and one that has created precedents that have been um, imitated and in some cases improved upon uh, in many other parts of the world. Um, first, starting in Latin America, but certainly <coughs> moving on to other parts of the world as well. And nowadays, truth-telling, truth-seeking uh, is a staple of uh, uh, how societies reckon with legacies of very serious human rights abuses. Um, CONADEP was not the very first commission, but it was a f the first very effective commission uh, that really uh, uh, broke uh, new ground uh, in terms of, uh, of dealing with the past. Um, it should be said uh, that uh, we should put this in the context of the transitions to democracy that m had started more or less uh, less than a year before the uh, presentation of the CONADEP report. Um, the transitions to democracy in Latin America basically start with the uh, election uh, that brought democracy back to Argentina in uh, October of uh, 1983 with the inauguration of President Raul Alfonsín in December of that year. Uh, but then it became a sort of a very uh, positive domino because in turn uh, countries that have been governed by military dictatorships or by very weak democracies with very strong military establishments <coughs> gradually became a region uh, of uh, democratic governance. Uh, for a variety of reasons, democracy um, still owes the people of Latin America quite a bit of uh, uh, delivering, de delivering in, in its promises. But one thing that is very positive is that we don't now face uh, uh, the threat of coup d'etat, uh, by and large at least, we don't face coup d'etat in Latin America. And I, I, I think a lot has to do, uh, it, in, it's 30 years, uh, is, uh, is probably for cer certainly the longest period of democratic rule that Argentina has experienced in its history. But it's also one of the longest periods of absence of uh, uh, <coughs> threats to the stability of democracy in most of Latin America as well. And one has to um, consider that at least one possible reason for this uh, prolonged and hopefully will be continue to be prolonged period of democratic governance has to do with, at that time, 1983, our democratic societies decided that, uh, that we owe something to the victims of the recent past. That um, the old business as usual way of dealing with those violations by forgiving and forgetting, uh, by sweeping the violations under the rug, uh, and by essentially yielding to the blackmail of military establishments that basically said, you, uh, uh, if you uh, insist on justice, if you insist on truth, uh, we can easily take over again, and then you'll have to deal with more violations. And you have to understand that in 1983, a lot of very well-meaning people in Latin American countries and elsewhere, including Washington, uh, who really uh, were never uh, complicit with the military and really uh, genuinely favored democracy, were very skeptical about uh, truth and justice. They, they felt that what Argentina did would uh, put off uh, transitions in Uruguay, in Chile, in Brazil, and in other parts of the world, and, and also that it could actually jeopardize democracy even in Argentina itself. But it was uh, important uh, that the, uh, the civil society of Argentina that had gone through a very rough period of repression uh, had kind of withstood uh, that pressure uh, by 
creating organizations like the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo and the Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, uh, and, and they emerged from the dictatorship with, um, uh, with a sense of, um, of credibility and of trust uh, that the Argentine people placed on them that allowed them to convey their agenda to broader circles of democratic thought in Argentina in ways that uh, force the issue to come forward. And uh, it's also significant that um, a minority party wins the elections of 90, 1983 precisely because its leader decides that human rights uh, are an important part of the new agenda. And uh, Raul Alfonsin defeats the Peronist uh, party who fielded a right-wing candidate uh, precisely by bringing what to do about the recent past to the forefront of the electoral agenda. So it, it's really significant that uh, uh, the mood in the, uh, that of course was very difficult to assess because of s seven years of repression, you, uh, people di didn't really know what the majority of the population felt or uh, you couldn't really express much uh, thought. And so even Argentines were surprised at uh, how uh, quickly the agenda of the human rights organizations was adopted by the majority of the public. Now this is, um, ha this has to do with several factors uh, because it's not that Argentina has done more about the past than other Latin American countries because there's something about Argentina itself but we have to reckon also with the fact that the military dictatorship in Argentina was the first one to have to beat a uh, a kind of a, an unorgan a disorganized and um, and um, uh, embarrassing retreat. Uh, you will remember that in 1982, the military dictatorship, already facing quite a bit of trouble at home with uh, 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 strikes and, and other popular movements uh, challenging it, uh, decided to to uh, to to do a, a kind of an, an ambitious and, and, and ultimately very irresponsible turn and invaded the, what we call the Malvinas Islands that uh, others call Fal the Falklands Islands. And that uh, resulted in, in war with uh, Great Britain, uh, with loss of life on all sides, um, uh, but with an embarrassing defeat for the military. So, in 1982, the military is defeated in this, uh, you know, misconceived uh, adventure, uh, and from then on, uh, it's all downhill for the military. They really uh, needed to get out of power, and so they did try, nevertheless, to put conditions on their uh, on the return of democracy, like all other military establishments did uh, in in Latin America. For example. Uh, Argentina issued a declaration uh, that all persons who were disappeared were considered to be dead for uh, legal purposes. And that only made matters worse for the military because it was outrageous. You know, without explaining what had happened to them, the government wanted to pull a rug over everybody's eyes and say, don't, don't even ask about uh, the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared. Uh, they, uh, they also passed uh, an amnesty law and that resulted in the release of several, many political prisoners, not all but most of them. And then they, they pretended that they could then uh, symmetrically apply amnesty to themselves. And this was already October of 1982, uh, yes 1982, uh, sorry 1983, and uh, the, even the courts that had been appointed or had been retained by the military dictatorship uh, challenged uh, the amnesty and uh, they, they, they allowed the release of prisoners certainly but they did not apply the amnesty to the violations that were beginning to be investigated at the time. So when President Alfonsin comes into power he comes with a relatively limited agenda uh, of how to uh, deal with the past and it included not only the creation of a commission on disappearances uh, but also the prosecution of the leaders of the juntas and of some uh, guerrilla leaders as well. Um, and uh, a proposal to uh, 
allow civilian courts eventually to have jurisdiction over cases that would start before military courts, um, but uh, to uh, try mostly those bearing the highest responsibility for the violations, not all of the potential um, <coughs> uh, perpetrators. But it was the pressure of the human rights community and of the public generally that expanded that agenda in the uh, legislative de debates because this had to be passed by law in some uh, questions. And so the National Commission on Disappearance of Persons begins its job and it, it does its job in about eight months only and without any cooperation from the armed forces. There was no access to documents, to, to documentation, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, the military kept uh, uh, itself um, you know, from providing any assistance to the discovery of the truth. So most of the work of the commission was done by, uh, by uh, inviting uh, relatives uh, and families of the disappeared to come forward and tell their story. And uh, the, the commission set up offices in downtown Buenos Aires and for days and weeks long lines of people uh, filed up to, to tell their stories. Uh, and then uh, an important part of the credibility of the CONADEP was that Alfonsín decided to, uh, uh, to uh, appoint to the commission uh, people who had um, uh, a reputation for being known in the community and for not having been either complicit with the military or supportive of the guerrillas. And there were people like that in Argentina, fortunately, like Marshall Meyer, who, whose picture you saw, but also the president itself of the commission, Ernesto Sabato, who was then a very well-known novelist, uh, well-known even beyond Argentina. Uh, and he had also this sense of uh, moral courage and, and moral responsibility uh, that conveyed to uh, the rest of the members uh, of, the, of the commission. Um, so the composition uh, of the commission uh, is one of the uh, good practices that is then inherited by many other truth commissions around the world. Uh, but of course it depends on finding people who can fill that kind of profile. As I said, the methodology was based mostly on testimonies from the victims or their families. But there was some uh, uh, attempts to, for example, the, the commission didn't have subpoena powers, but when it learned of, for example, a testimony uh, identifying a place of detention as a clandestine center, uh, they would uh, go to, to courts or to prosecutors and ask to, uh, for permission to uh, inspect them. And in that manner, and they did it around the country, they came up with an uh, identifying uh, something like 350 places of detention around the country. I mean, several of them were already known because some survivors had given testimony abroad, etc. But uh, I don't think anybody really reckoned with the fact that there were 350 different clandestine centers all over the country. So, <coughs> the, the, the one very intelligent thing that the Commission did, even before publishing its report, was to have a television program one night in which all they did was to uh, show relatives of the disappeared speaking about what had happened to their loved ones, their children, their husbands, etc. Um, and uh, they were just, uh, the camera just went to them one by one, uh, everybody else being in the dark and that. And they, they told their story in, in about two hours in primetime television. Uh, without uh, any, you know, any uh, other material, without uh, adjectives, without adverbs, just basically telling their story. And it created an, in, an enormous wave of support uh, for the plight of the relatives of the disappeared and made it possible for everybody to understand that the state and the society owes something to those families who are still uh, seeking to establish the fate and whereabouts of their loved ones. When the report was published uh, 30 years ago tomorrow, uh, the report uh, did not 
uh, include names of perpetrators, although the Commission had learned in the context of its work something like 400 or 500 names. Um, the, the civil society organizations then, because they had access to the same files more or less, uh, then published uh, that list. And that created pressure towards uh, prosecutions. And, and in, that, um, in that context, the trials of the juntas began. And that's another um, important milestone in uh, the way Argentina reckoned with the past. Because for about six months in uh, public hearings, the uh, uh, nine uh, members of the juntas that had governed Argentina in the six years of the dictatorship were put on the dock and prosecuted for their complicity or their participation in, uh, in, 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 in crimes, uh, including disappearances, but also some other ones. And it's very important to note that the, uh, the work of the CONADEP, especially the files that it collected, were an important uh, uh, first step in the direction of uh, uh, making it possible to prosecute uh, the generals and admirals uh, that were, were, had been all too powerful only a few years uh, before. Uh, as you know, uh, that uh, trial ended in the conviction and, and sentencing to life imprisonment of at least two of them, General Videla and Admiral Maceda. But unfortunately, uh, they were released about six or seven years later uh, by pardons by President Menem, who succeeded Alfonsin in 1990, 1989. Uh, but in the meantime, the, the further trials, uh, there was at least one other one, but there were many more coming, and they were rendered impossible because under pressure from the military, the government of al uh passed two laws uh, that were called uh, punto final and due obedience that had the effect of being amnesty laws, although the name amnesty was not uh, mentioned. Um, and and that, uh, uh, th th those laws apply to all but the, the highest ranks, about 20 or so, 25 uh, highest ranking military, including those who had been convicted. Uh, but those were then uh, covered by the, the pardons that I just mentioned by President Menem. So we're back in 1990 uh, um, and we're down. To, we're all the way back to full impunity for the human rights violations. But it's interesting that the the human rights community of Argentina uh, never yielded it in, in its insistence that accountability had to happen. And so, more or less, uh, in uh, the middle of that decade, um, uh, uh, an investigative journalist, Horacio Verbisky, published the testimony of a naval officer who who said that he himself had participated in the way the Navy disposed of the disappeared by throwing them into the ocean or into the river plate by, from, from airplanes. And that created another wave of uh, uh, pressure on uh, the institutions of Argentina to look, uh, uh, to, to, to reckon with this testimony. The most important thing that happened, or one of the important things that happened was that the commander-in-chief of the army at the time, General Balsa, uh, made a very striking public apology to the uh, public of Argentina for what the army had done. And, and he made a, a, a very credible public apology because, maybe by chance, but he had not been a participant in the dirty war. He had actually been mostly in foreign posts and he was also, uh, he had, uh, distinguished himself uh, uh, in the Malvinas Falklands War uh, by fighting uh, uh, a ridiculous war, but fighting it with honor. And so he had quite a bit of uh, predicament, or, or you know, uh, sorry, quite a bit of um, influence over uh, the, the rest of uh, his comrade in arms, and also particularly quite a bit of credibility with the public. And at that, more or less simultaneously with that, and also on the basis of the testimony uh, of uh, this uh, naval officer, um, the, the human rights groups came up with a great idea. Uh, and it was owed mostly to my friend and mentor, unfortunately passed away now many years ago, Emilio Mignone, 
whose daughter her, herself was among the disappeared and who had created what I consider today the premier human rights organization in Latin America, the Center for Legal and Social Studies, CELS. He went to court um, and, and on the basis of international law standards urged the courts to investigate the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared on the basis of the uh, testimony by, uh, uh, by, uh, by this naval officer, but also on the basis of the apology by Balsa. Because uh, essentially saying, well, that's not enough. A apology is fine, but you have to investigate and you have to tell the public. So that is the uh, origin. At, at first, the courts uh, wavered, and the Supreme Court, in less than a month, changed its mind. First, in a case called La Paco, uh, also the mother of a disappeared, uh, they said, no, there's no such thing as a right to truth, and we can't use the courts to investigate. Uh, disappearances because there's, there's these amnesty, pseudo amnesty laws uh, are an obstacle to that. But then in a second case called Urteaga, the, uh, where the, the families of um, a high ranking leader of the ERP guerrilla who was taken with, uh, with, with others and never found again, um, in the case called Urteaga, the Supreme Court changes its mind and says, yeah. Uh, the regular procedures for criminal investigation can be used even if we don't prosecute anybody to establish the facts and to tell the victims and society the truth about what happened. And that's the beginning of what then were called the truth trials. Because after that, courts all over uh, Argentina, some more diligently and others less, but they started to entertain procedures by which they tried to establish uh, the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared. And they did have subpoena power, so sometimes they went uh, to documents and sometimes they went to offices. But mostly they, they heard the victims and the relatives of the victims in public hearings. And, they, uh, and that became quite a bit of, of pressure until uh, later, uh, in, because of the information gathered in those truth trials, uh, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals for Buenos Aires, uh, fir sorry, first a district court, uh, d declared the uh, due obedience and punto final laws uh, unconstitutional. That went to the Federal Court of Appeals, that was uh, affirmed, and eventually in 2005, the Supreme Court also said that the, uh, uh, the due obedience laws and, uh, and, and punto final laws could not be an obstacle for uh, investigation and prosecution of those crimes. So now we have a second cycle of investigation and prosecution. We don't have a truth commission, uh, but a lot of the truth is being revealed in the literally hundreds of cases that are being litigated around the country today. Some are, have already finished with uh, convictions uh, and with people serving time. Uh, others are awaiting trial. Um, uh, and it's a very uh, extensive uh, exploration of the, of the facts, but also with establishing individual criminal responsibility for them as well. So I just want to, uh, I'm sorry to have been so detailed in the explanation, and, 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 and you can tell that it was also at the risk of simplification, because it is 30 years uh, explained in a few words. but. Uh, I want to say something about how this experience has now yielded international standards that are binding uh, in international law. And first of all, uh, I'd like to say that although uh, now we have a convention on disappearances, but of course uh, both an inter-American one and a, and a universal one, a United Nations convention, but of course they cannot be applied retroactively. So. Uh, but we also have decisions by uh, established uh, courts uh, of human rights protection of an international nature, like the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, which in its very first adversarial case called Velázquez Rodríguez versus Honduras, had to deal with disappearances. And the court uh, made findings that are still uh, very often quoted and cited everywhere in, in the world today, 
because it said, first of all, that unmistakably disappearances are a crime against humanity. And that if they are a crime against humanity, the legal effect of that is that there is an absolute uh, binding obligation on the part of the state to investigate, prosecute, and punish all those who may be responsible. But the Velasquez court went further and said that the, uh, the state is also obligated to, uh, to reveal the truth about the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared, uh, both to the relatives and to society at large. And in Velasquez, this is a 1988 decision, the court says, and that obligation remains for as long as there's any doubt about the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared. And it, it's an amazing uh, uh, setting up of the standard, uh, but the, the good thing is that it, has, it was then continued by decisions by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, mostly dealing with amnesty laws, but also with further decisions by the Inter-American Court uh, in cases uh, like um, Barrios Altos, uh, Peru, uh, case against Peru, in which not only the court said you have to investigate, prosecute, and punish, but also amnesty laws are contrary to the American Convention on Human Rights, and therefore you have to deny them legal effect in the domestic jurisdiction. This is a 2000, and, uh, 2000 case uh, against Peru. Uh, and then more recently, in a case called uh, Almonacid Arellano versus Chile, uh, the court went even further and said, uh, you have to remove all obstacles to investigation, prosecution, and punishment, and truth-telling. You have to eliminate uh, obstacles like amnesty laws, self-amnesty laws, uh, pseudo-amnesty laws, whatever you call them, you, you can't uh, have them. And beyond that, you have to remove obstacles like pardons, you have to remove obstacles like statutes of limitation, etc. You know, a very sweeping judgment. Uh, uh, but it, the, it, the interesting thing is that if you look outside of the region, in the European Court, for example, or in the universal system, there are many uh, uh, decisions that go in the same direction. They don't actually say as much as the Inter-American Court has said, but they do go in the direction of there being an obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish crimes that are widespread or systematic and that therefore uh, fall under the ru rubric of crimes against humanity. In, uh, in the case of the right to truth, the Inter-American Court, interestingly, at first kind of wavered in a case called Castillo Pais, that I'm sure Eduardo Gonzalez can talk to you about because he worked on that case, and it's a Peruvian case. The court uh, said the commission and the petitioners are urging us to say that there is a right to truth, and the court said, well, there is an emerging tendency to recognize the, the, the right to truth, but it hasn't achieved the status of an international norm uh, as of the Castillo Pais case. But only a couple of years later, in a case called Trujillo Orosa uh, uh, versus Bolivia, it actually said, yes, right to truth is part of the American Convention. There is an obligation on the state to reveal the truth and a right by the relatives and by society to insist on the truth. So. Now, uh, does that make it an international law standard? Uh, I think so. Uh, is it an emerging standard? I used the word emerging standard some years ago. I would say that it has already emerged. It's not uh, an emerging standard anymore because these decisions, uh, and, and many that I didn't mention, are based on uh, an interpretation of long existing treaty, treaties in human rights, like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, basically on, uh, 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 on three aspects. One, the categorization of uh, a human rights violation of a certain type as a crime against humanity. I already mentioned what that means. The second one is the fact that these violations uh, are of rights that cannot be suspended even during an emergency. And so if, you, if the state cannot uh, suspend the right to life, for example, or the right to be free from torture, even in the worst of emergencies, then it follows that it cannot suspend it ex post facto by saying, well, we did it, but now we're going to uh, sweep it under the rug. And, 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 the, th and the third argument is uh, what is called the right to a remedy. All human rights uh, treaties are based on the state having an obligation to prevent violations and an obligation to mobilize 
the state apparatus if a violation occurs anyway. And depending on what the violation is, what the state has to do in response to the violation varies as well. In the case of serious human rights violations, like the right to life and the right to personal integrity, that uh, action by the state cannot be anything other than, or cannot uh, preclude the obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish. So that the right to a remedy, based also on another principle of human rights law that's called the duty to ensure rights, rather than to respect them only, but also to guarantee them, to ensure them, all of that is the, uh, is the argumentation that builds this uh, sense of an affirmative, uh, binding, mandatory, and no longer emerging obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish certain violations and to uh, tell the truth about them as well. And that's why nowadays we talk about a right to truth. Uh, and I think it's appropriate that we say that it's a right to truth that goes together with the right to justice and the right to reparations and the right to uh, reformed institutions because <coughs> it's no longer the case that countries uh, should be able to choose. We'll, we'll, we won't prosecute anybody, but we'll give them a, a report and we'll call that truth, right? Uh, the state has an obligation to, to, to conduct in good faith and to the utmost of its capabilities the pursuit of the truth and the pursuit of justice. And in fact, in most cases of truth commissions that we know of, they've been most successful when they haven't been pitted against the possibility of justice when in fact they have opened up uh, paths towards justice like the CONADEP did with respect to the prosecutions in Argentina and still doing because the CONADEP archives and report is still a very important basis of the prosecutions that are going on right now. I'm sorry that I've gone on too long but I'm more interested in your comments and questions so maybe we can have an exchange now. Thank you very much. considering we're still finding children of the, of the missing, I wonder how impunity and prosecution work on military families who took the children of Los Angeles. Well, it, it, interesting that you mentioned because uh, even under pressure from the military and the government of Alfonsin, when these uh, amnesty laws were passed, the, uh, the case of the children taken from their mothers when their mothers were disappeared or the, who were born in captivity was specifically excluded from the amnesties. So those cases were ongoing all along. Unfortunately not going very, very far or very fast, but in fact at, at the same time when we were having truth trials, there were criminal trials for some uh, cases of people who had uh, altered the identity, as they called it in legalese in Argentina, of children taken with their mothers or born in captivity. And so, for example, Videla uh, was convicted even before the Supreme Court decision was convicted in one of those cases. And, of course, it depended on whether you had evidence of who was directly or personally complicit in the taking. But now there are many cases going on. Uh, they, they, now we know, for example, that uh, sort of maternity wards were created in the dungeons of these um, clandestine detention centers uh, where uh, medical doctors, mostly belonging to the Navy or to the Army or to the police, actually came and delivered babies and some of them were taken within hours from their mothers and then the mothers were killed. And the children were given away mostly to military families but there are some cases in which the adoptive parents uh, there's it's definitely an irregular adoption because it's not a uh, it's not a legal adoption, but they were not personally complicit in it. They they thought that they were given a child who was abandoned by the mother, or they found them in a ho uh, him or her on a hospital in a hospital uh, or something like that. But unfortunately, there are cases in which the the appropriators of the child were themselves complicit in the murder of the mother and in the torture of the mother as well, uh, not to draw too fine a point on it. So in those cases there have been prosecutions and some convictions and there are some other ones 
that are ongoing, ongoing as well. Uh, but the cases now, as I said, the prosecutions are wide ranging now. They deal with uh, uh, well, mostly military personnel, some police, some uh, um, some of the other uh, uh, protective forces, because the repression, the dirty war, was conducted by what they call task forces, and many of them had people from different forces. The good thing is that not not everybody who was a member of the military was complicit in this. So it's not a witch hunt. It's not because you wore a uniform that you're now in the dock. The cases only apply to those people where there's evidence. Uh, and the evidence, uh, you know, uh, there's been some uh, acquittals as well, <coughs> which I think uh, says a lot about how uh, carefully Argentina is respecting the rights to a fair trial that these people have, the same rights that they denied their victims. So, um, uh, in essence, uh, there are now 115 uh, kids who have been found, I mean, who have been identified as uh, being born of, uh, um, of a disappeared person uh, or taken with a disappeared person. There were some cases in, in the, in, during the dirty war in which the military uh, did give the babies to, to the next of kin. Uh, not, so not all of them were put in the circuit of disappearances and changed identity. But the abuelas believe that about 400 were put in that circuit. I don't know if they'll ever prove all 400, but it's really amazing that they've already uh, identified and uh, recovered, as they call it, 115 already. Um, and apparently after the, the, the 114, which happened to be the grandson of the founder and most visible head of the abuelas, uh, Estela Carlotto, uh, this boy who is now 36 or so, uh, uh, he, came, uh, he came forward, he, uh, he suspected that he was uh, adopted and, and uh, the DNA test proved that he is uh, Estela's uh, grandson. And they made a big uh, announcement that, uh, you know, if you have any doubts about your identity, come forward. You know, we'll welcome you. And I understand that uh, the different offices of the abuelas were flooded with requests. Now, not all of them may lead to identifying children of the dirty war, but uh, I think it is possible to predict that we'll go far beyond the 115. The Senate torture report has been so much in the news and so much discussed of, of the extent to which our own government has conducted torture in recent years. And um, obviously it, it may, may, may not have been on nearly as grand a scale. Um, more relevant, it wasn't people of our own country that we were torturing. So, you know, I, I just like to hear your thoughts on, you know, where we go from here in terms of accountability. Some of us are trying to, um, to pull together a North Carolina Commission on Torture, um, having to do with the torture connections right here in North Carolina, such as Aero Contractors in Johnson County, one of the major torture taxi companies that were used by the Bush administration. So, um, what are your thoughts on how likely it is that either we here in North Carolina or the country as a whole will, will be able to pursue real truth and real justice? Uh, I've uh, addressed myself to the U.S. government and uh, publicly also, uh, and, and I've said uh, essentially that it, it's very good for President Obama to have uh, prohibited torture in, I think, his first or second day in office by an executive order, but at the same time that that's not enough. The international standard with regard to torture specifically says not only that the state has to prevent it from happening, that part uh, seems to have full, been fulfilled, but also to investigate, prosecute, and punish every act of torture. And that is, it, 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 it is not dependent on whether we consider it a crime against humanity or a war crime, because the Convention Against Torture, of which the United States is a signatory, uh, establishes that uh, obligation even for a single act of torture. So I've been insisting uh, uh, the next step should be for the report of the Senate Intelligence Committee to be 
released uh, with, uh, without reductions or at least with the reductions uh, reduced to a minimum. Um, and it's very worrisome that it's taking so long for a decision that the Senate Intelligence Committee itself wants to, to see done. Uh, but I'm hoping that once we have uh, that report out and we can all debate it, then uh, next steps about possible prosecution might follow. I think, in fact, the decision by the Justice Department under the Obama administration uh, to uh, preclude any investigation uh, on, uh, of the torture that might have happened during the Bush administration years uh, is also a violation of international law for the reasons I've already mentioned. But um, as you know, the Justice Department uh, has stated that because of the so-called torture memos, um, the people who actually you know, behave themselves in accordance with the torture memos may have been under a uh, well-founded uh, reason to believe that what they were doing was legal. Now, that's surprising to me because if, uh, if the, the, the Bush administration itself with, withdrew those torture memos because they, th they knew that, uh, and, and as soon as they became public, because they were secret to begin with, and if they withdrew them was because there wasn't uh, a, a proper statement of the law. So now to use them as a basis for non-prosecution seems to me uh, to uh, misstate the, the standard in international law. Now, what can happen, I, re I really do think it depends on pressure from society. As I've been <laughs> exemplifying with Argentina, uh, what happens of a good nature happens mostly because of the dedication and pressure by uh, organized uh, uh, so civil society and by victims. And this is something that's not going to happen anytime soon in the United States, precisely for what you said, that the, the victims are counted among uh, non-US citizens and even people whose face we don't see, whose names we don't want to even know how to pronounce. And therefore, the pressure is just not there. Now, that doesn't, that, that doesn't justify inaction, and especially it doesn't justify violations of state obligations by the United States government. But if you ask me if I think it's going to happen, I think it's going to take a lot of work, a, a, lot, a lot of work, a lot of dedication by all of us to get to a point where we, we think that this is not going to happen again because we dealt with the legacy of the recent past effectively. My question, and, uh, and uh, well, maybe I cannot say it exactly in English because my first language is Spanish. Espero que no se ofenda. I hope you. How it's possible that a country like Argentina that produced Sarmiento, Julio Cortázar, Borges, and so, so many other people had governments like exactly Videla, had uh, uh, Perón, I'm sorry, uh, well, Evita, of course, and uh, problems like La Amia, and nothing was done to clarify this. I had very good friends from Argentina also, because uh, I lived in Mexico for 46 years, and my business uh, had a, a product from Argentina called Quebracho, which you know. So, excuse me, but uh, this is the question that I wanted to, to do to you, how Argentina uh, and besides this, it's a country of immigrants and has the number one psychiatrist in the world, is, uh, psychologos. So, excuse me, but this is the question that uh, I had and when I uh, read about the opportunity that you're coming. I said, okay, I will go. Well, I think, I think we have many psychologists because we need them. <laughs> um, I mean, first, I wouldn't put uh, all those international figures in the same categories. Uh, and, and even each one of them has uh, great uh, contributions to 
culture and to uh, welfare uh, and to dignified wor uh, life, but they were also human beings and they also had their um, mi uh, faults and their misgivings. Now, I, uh, you, you, uh, I talked about something that uh, makes me very proud to be an Argentine, and it is the way we dealt with the past. And I, I think it, it, it is a, a, a matter of pride uh, and justified pride that we have done as much as we did, even in the face of so many uh, obstacles, complications, etc. But of course, there are many things that we are not proud of. Uh, there are many things that we uh, need to do better to ourselves uh, and to and to our children and grandchildren. Uh, but you know, they are not any worse or any better than other societies. We. We, uh, I started to say that we had a kind of, uh, we, we did better on, on accountability, among other things, because of the weakness of the uh, military during the transition. So uh, that's not something that the Uruguayans had the luxury of, for example, or the Brazilians. Uh, so I did uh, want to qualify um, uh, the merits of what Argentina did. Now, uh, with respect to uh, to why uh, we have the troubled uh, uh, politics that we continue to have today, even with the democratic process as it still is, it's still very uh, energetically democratic. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, I, I don't have an answer as to why societies behave the way they behave. I mean, all societies have uh, great contributions and some you know, embarrassing things that they shouldn't be proud of. Uh, now, you and I are probably going to disagree, agree on some, uh, but disagree on some others uh, of those figures that you mentioned. Uh, but I want to stress that uh, it's not a question of, uh, <coughs> of, of personalities. It's a question of, you know, trying to, to live up to uh, what we, to, to the, the premise of democracy is respecting each other and tolerating other people's views and not assigning blame to one party or the other for what happened in the past. Unfortunately, we in Argentina have not overcome that. There's still incredible sectarianism. So we tend, if, if we are Peronists, we tend to blame everything on the anti-Peronist forces. If we are anti-Peronist, we tend to blame everything on Peron and Evita. And very few people, I mean, I wouldn't say very few, because I think the younger generations are a little better at that. But they start to recognize that the guy next door or the, 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 the woman next, next to us in, a, in law school uh, may come from a parentist family, but she's not responsible for whatever you know, crimes we assign to Peron and Evita. Uh, but unfortunately, there's still quite a bit of that intolerance. And, uh, why we haven't been able, to, we, we created one of the most egalitarian societies in Latin America together with Uruguay and more recently Costa Rica and yet you know it's no longer as egalitarian as it used to be but it's still very much uh, uh, egalitarian and yet we haven't been able to create a political system in which we can all live, uh, succeed each other, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose but we do have uh, state policies, things that we, we all agree on. Um, one of the few state policies that we do have in Argentina is accountability for past abuses. And I keep my fingers crossed that we will continue to have that agreement because it's not all that certain. Anything could happen. But in, in the, beginning in the 80s and until now, opinion polls have consistently said that 80% of the public of Argentina wants trials, once truth-telling, once reparations to the victims, etc. That, quite frankly, is the only major issue of public policy that I can think of in which we have that much of agreement. Uh, that's a sad commentary to make because we, we ought to have the same kind of agreement, for example, with respect to the foreign debt and the pressures that we're under by what we call, and it's not Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, everybody calls vulture uh, funds. Uh, and we don't. I mean, there are all kinds of voices in Argentina saying, pay them, pay them, please pay them. You know? So, well, that's an example. So, uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a, a more complete answer to, to that very interesting question. Yeah, do you think now those people are thinking differently because of all their grandchildren that are being sold? Do you think that has an effect on those people who still believe, you know, who live during Peron's governmental world of life for their families and that the military actually more and more safer place to be? Do you think it's that's changed or? No, no, I don't, well, I think it changed because the military overplayed its hand. It was, uh, you know, uh, incredible. But I can remember, I was in prison when the military took over, and families, including my family, would come and say, well, now it's going to be better. And we had the sense that it was going to be a lot worse, and unfortunately, we were right. Now, my family at least recognized that they were wrong. I suppose other families did as well. And, but but uh, the, the, the government of Isabel Perón, who had imprisoned me, for example, uh, um, was so chaotic and so corrupt and at the same time so repressive that people were understandably uh, hoping for a change. Uh, now, we could, I, I could tell, and a lot of my friends could tell, that that, that change was not going to be for the better. But I think it's understandable for people who are not involved in politics, who are not, you know, bearing the brunt of repression directly, to to think that maybe things will at least be in a more even keel, that there wouldn't be innocent uh, people drawn into the dirty war and things like that, that there would be a, a harsh uh, mano dura kind of response, but that it would be uh, that it would be more serious and systematic. And, and for example, that the, the paramilitary groups like uh, uh, the AAA and uh, Libertadores de America uh, would be uh, would be pro prohibited. But in fact, they didn't prohibit it. They incorporated it into official policy, and they did that and worse than the paramilitary groups did. So, I mean, the, the deterioration into the dirty war was in stages. It was. It didn't begin on uh, 26 March, 24 March of 1976, uh, and that maybe explains uh, part of the of the previous question as well. Um, but I have to say that if you could identify political affiliation, the military persecuted more Peronists than any other uh, uh, political group. Uh, so. Uh, it's true that Peronism has a lot of, um, you know, uh, blame to account for through the years, starting in 1946, not, not only in recent years. But you have to reckon with the past that the persecution was mostly unleashed against the Peronist people, and especially the rank and file common men and women who for some reason are Peronists. And you can disagree with them, but they are Peronists. And so, uh, the fact that they were mostly persecuted uh, should say something about, uh, uh, you know, uh, how the, you apportion different kinds of blame for what has been going on uh, wrong in Argentina for many years. I just wanted to know, so for people who are placed in exile um, or who were tortured and left self-imposed exile, um, there's this tension between the folks who remain in the homeland and their diaspora in terms of who has the authority to tell the story of what happened in that country. Um, do you, what is the, what's the fix, do you think, to, to this kind of separation of validity? Because in some ways, to me, it sounds almost like an iteration of a very nationalist discourse that brought the dirty war into being, for instance. You count it, I think you don't. Yeah. Well, I have to say that I uh, decided not to return to Argentina after 1983. In fact, I've returned every year, but not to live. Uh, and I haven't experienced anybody telling them, you shut up because you weren't here, or you shut up because you're no longer part of our community. But that's me, and it may be that, the, that, that I haven't experienced that because, among other things, I work in human rights, and I've been doing different internationally recognized things, and so, but. But also, quite frankly, the diaspora in Argentina uh, mostly returned to Argentina. Unlike me, most people, when they could, they returned to Argentina. And as far as I can tell, they were, you know, recognized uh, uh, as part of the 
uh, and, and, you know, and given the opportunity to speak out on the dirty war, whether they had uh, spent most of the time abroad or not. Um, but that's my experience, and, I, and, and uh, I think the reason is partly that the, fortunately the dictatorship was relatively short-lived, because six or seven years, if you go into exile and you probably weren't there the six years, but say four years, and you have a chance to go back, you take it, because you, you're not really well established elsewhere. And so I don't think, uh, I, I know what you mean with respect to some other countries, but I don't think it applies as much to, to, to Argentina today. Now, uh, if, if, it is, if it applies at all, I agree with you that, you know, we, those of us who lived abroad during the dictatorship didn't do it exactly out of choice. You know, we were forced into exile and they, nobody can blame us for uh, not being there when things happened. Um, and, you know, and, and many escaped uh, before being caught. Uh, they were not themselves victims of torture or even of imprisonment, but they would have been if they stayed. And, and I think people recognize that. I don't think anybody really faults them. Uh, and if they do, you know, I, of course, completely disagree. Now, you can then, like me, live 30 years abroad and, and raise children and grandchildren abroad, but uh, if you continue to be interested in the affairs of your nation and participating as much as you can, obviously with due respect for those who are there and who, who are more proximate to, to, to having op and more entitled to having opinions than one has, but I don't think anybody tells us not to, not to say what we think. That's my experience. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding the last years of the truth trials. As you were saying, there is a large collaboration between the society and victims, but I'm assuming also the military wants to tell their stories as well. Why I'm thinking of the particular case of Brazil, where we have a military establishment who calls the truth mission the enemy, and does not participate into finding so I was just wondering if, if the military has been collaborative in the past years or not, when I mean, in the, in the case of Argentina, the military uh, at first did not want to cooperate in any way. And in fact, uh, they were pleased to let uh, Videla and Macera and others be more or less scapegoated uh, so that they didn't have to contribute to, uh, by, for example, with documentation. Uh, but interestingly, for example, uh, just a few months ago, the Ministry of Defense found uh, an archive of decisions on the dirty war by the juntas. Uh, 280 uh, minutes of 280 sessions of the junta where you know, important things like the fate of an individual were decided. Um, they only found them now and uh, they are uh, making them available to, to the public generally but also to, to the courts and prosecutors and also even to um, archives like the one you have here at Duke. Uh, I think it would be important for you to, to, to get those collections. Uh, uh, just yesterday, before coming to, to Duke, uh, I participated in a meet, meeting in, uh, in my law school in the uh, American University where the Minister of Defense gave us a, a set of copies. Um, now those, those uh, documents are still being processed and, and, and and analyze so, but it, but it seems to me that they will probably do quite a bit of contribution to to the uh, to the establishment of the facts and to prosecutions as well. But the military uh, did not uh, try to have its version uh, shown uh, individually. Nowadays, when people are being prosecuted, uh, and there is some some support for them, obviously, in society and in the media, for example. Not much, but there is some. And they tend to, to say all the time, well, that's part of the story, but they don't tell the whole story and all that. And when you ask them, well, what is the other part of the story that's not known? All they say is that the guerrillas committed atrocities as well. Never a point in discussion. Of course they did. And some of them were prosecuted and some were not. Now this, uh, even if they had committed many more atrocities, this would not justify what the military did. 
So what kind of defense is there? So I don't think, quite frankly, that they have a, a, a leg to stand on if they say the whole story is not known, because the whole story about what happened to the mother of the, of, uh, uh, I mean, to a disappeared woman who gave birth and his child was taken away and then she was taken and killed. Uh, what is the other side of the story? We have time for one more question. Is anybody here? Anybody else? Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Juan. Thank you. <laughs> Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.